Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives. I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm here with High Fidelity and Jim Stewartson. We are an investigative show about disinformation as well as many other things. And today we are on episode 73. We have our dear friend Monique Kamara with us and we are gonna be talking about psychological disarmament, truth and unity, and many more important stories coming out of Europe and the war in Ukraine. Hello gentlemen, how are you? You know, it is what it is. Let's put it back. <laughs> That's right. It is, right. Is, is what it is. All right. <laughs> let's just jump right into front loaded then, shall we? Front loaded. All right. So I just want to start with uh, something we're going to be talking about with Monique, which is uh, the counter offensive for messaging and as well as psychological disarmament from many different directions. And one thing I'm going to encourage people who are trying to fight fascism, I'm going to encourage people to think before they post. Yesterday, people who I consider allies in the fight against Putin and other authoritarians posted a video of, uh, from Russian propaganda of a nuclear annihilation and what it would look like uh, of Los Angeles and New York. And I can't unsee it now. And I also saw a video of a Russian entertainer pushing a nuclear button during his concert, and I can't unsee that either. What I would like to encourage people to do is screenshot things, think it through. Jim does a great job with the counter-offensive messaging before he posts things. I want people to stop doing Putin's work for him because we are losing the information war. And we don't have a lot of time left in our country. It's a year from today of filming that we vote in 2024. So that is what I wanted to begin with. And of course, I'm not going to show you the images because I don't want to sear your brain with Russian propaganda as well. Gentlemen? Yeah, I mean, that that is the, the whole point of it, right? And one thing that's important also about this is it, everything about the message matters, right? I, I had a, a, a disagreement with um, Mehdi Hassan who I, you know, uh, agree with about most things, but posted something from Donbass Devushka <laughs> because, because he thought it made his point. And I said, hey, bro, uh, this is a Kremlin propagandist who posts pictures of dead Ukrainians all day long on Telegram. What are you doing? And he said back to me, well, isn't it, mostly important that you know the, the fact I'm like actually no yeah because I mean Marshall McLuhan the medium is the message where is it coming from who are you exposing bingo who 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 are you promoting by doing that you must give context you must label you must explain if you can't then don't. Thank you so much for that, Jim. I'm looking at votniksoup.com for those who wish to know more about who he's talking about. Uh, Donbass uh, Dubushka is right there and you can learn what a Votnik this account is. And that of course is uh, slang for Russian propagandist. And my gosh, that is so important. The medium is the message and people are not thinking it through. And you know, our goal with this show and many more to come is for people to stop again facilitating the fascist creep whether you know and many people are doing it inadvertently high five well the the whole point of them putting this propaganda out is traumatizing people and they want people traumatized and they want them to associate it you can see it in the you know Israeli, uh, the shootings at the music festival that are everywhere online. You can see Hamas doing it with videos out of Syria that are supposedly of Palestine, but they're not, right? It's all lies, but it does traumatize people. It dissociates them. It makes them angry. It turns them into weapons of social destruction. Stop it. Thank you. Anything else? 
All right, let's move on. Okay, so number two on front loaded, I want to refer people to Alex Jones, number 11 in my American Monster series at Betty Dangerous. Why this is so important is that I uh, have been watching, you know, um, him closely as I was doing the research for this. And on the day I did this report, he actually was uh, platforming a Holocaust denier. Uh, and that was just a couple of days ago. And I also noticed that he had no trouble crying for pretend children when he was pushing the Pizzagate PSYOP and yet had no tears for the real children who died in mass shootings whose parents who were in terrible grief were targeted by him and the people who followed him uh, too many people, of course, who've been stalking these parents. And I just bring it up because we have to harden ourselves against supervillains. And Alex Jones just went on Russian propagandist Solofiev's show for 45 minutes to do pure Russian propaganda while calling himself a patriot. We need to know who these people are. We need to not allow them to abuse our citizens and our, our friends' minds with their absolute um, criminal uh, psychological activities. And Jim, I know you can say this much better than I can, but I'm, I'm, I'm fuming about what I've learned recently. Speaking of trauma, right? What Alex, first of all, Alex Jones had a Russian passport in 2000. That the dude has been his producer, his Russian, like, I mean, it's just, it's been that way um, for a long time. But his specialty is trauma, is to generate trauma. So why would he deny Sandy Hook? Because it is the most traumatic possible thing to drag your drag people's minds through right mm -hmm. just just to continuously bring up the murder of 21 children mm -hmm. um in the most exploitative way possible and then using it to weaponize against the victims of the of the crime that that's designed it's designed to be the most tra traumatic possible thing you could bring up and the most traumatic possible way to weaponize it. Um, there's a reason why he's a negative billionaire right now, um, uh, because he traumatized the hell out of, of not just the victims, not just Fred and others, um, you know, but so many um you know people who who have had to you know just endure it absolutely hi-fi i i am actually uh for my statement on alex jones i'm just going to read the quote i gave you for your piece because i think it pretty well sums it up alex jones isn't just a propagandist He's a Russian officer in a military grade psychological operation to overthrow American democracy. He is a fear monger and a smear merchant attacking innocent Americans to spread lies and criminally defame decent people. That is his primary mission, his standard operating procedure, attack the people, attack the institutions, attack his country. His lies etch themselves like acid into the minds of his countrymen and turned citizens into weapons of social destruction. It is no coincidence he was at the forefront of activity on January 6, 2021. He was ordered there by his superiors, as he readily admits. And as a secondary hustle, he supports his criminal operations through shady online sales of snake oil. He is a con man. He is both a grifter and a threat. He is a soulless Captain Elmer Gantryovich burning down the country he claims to love while shilling a mountain of scientifically questionable elixirs and sewer water tonics for whatever ailments he has fear seared into his audience's broken minds. Uh, this, beautiful. this is a mic. I'm dropping it. <laughs> beautiful. 
Fear oh, seared. I love that sewer water and fear seared. Elmer Gantriovich. I mean, it was really a brilliant quote, but also when he talks about the broken minds, the people who are actually in prison or have done prison time who are InfoWars uh, acolytes who went after the victims of, uh, you know, whose children were, were victimized by, you know, killed by gun violence, you know, it, they believe it. They have this community where they actually believe these lies. They participate in a community. Jim knows all about this through his studies of QAnon. And I'm glad that the person who stalked Fred Gutenberg is getting one year in federal prison. I'm glad that he's not going to be able to listen to InfoWars when he comes out and will only be allowed to use his computer for work. But I'm not happy that the supervillains that we report on are still free to traumatize people further because, as I said in my report, who's next? Who are they going to target next? Because they continue these harms unabated. And can I just point out just briefly? So for the last 24 hours, Mike Flynn, speaking of, has been in trying to get uh, Obama, um, you know, put him in danger. Let's put it that way. Jesus Christ. Um, by continuously pushing this sort of Pizzagate rhetoric at him and ginning up hatred by his followers. He said, go away, capitalize. You know, he's perverse. He's deviant. And make him trend, right? Wow. He's doing the same fucking thing he did in 2016. He did again in 2020. And he's doing it again. And we're just sitting around fucking waiting for it again. The third time, it's just mind boggling. I, I just do not get it. Well, you know, I mean, we need to know uh, if our highest, you know, level intelligence and law enforcement, uh, you know, authorities, what side they're on. Because if you're on the side of democracy, arrest some of these people, they're, they're dangerous. They're literally harming, you know, people in real time. And as we'll talk about with Monique, it's going to get worse. So please help us. Don't have us be the people who are pointing this out week after week. And, 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 and please, these people are global security threats, not just national security threats. So um, thank you for that. And always thank you guys for the support that you give me when I tell these stories, because they're, 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 they're hard to talk about. And uh knowing that we all have each other's emotional backs is really important. And speaking of people who have our emotional backs and have our nation's emotional back, uh, I got to meet Ruth ben -Giot last night, and I'm still um, super happy about that. And I just wanted to point out to those who support RadPod, those who support me at Betty Dangerous, those who support Jim's Mind War, and those of you who support Byline Supplement, uh, we are bringing Ruth on to meet uh, the Byline Supplement audience on Wednesday, November 8th. So please, if you support Byline Supplement, join us. She's going to be part of our news meeting that day. We're going to be talking about what we all can be doing better as far as messaging goes. And she gave me a great quote for a report that ran today in Byline Supplement um, about toxic strong men that many autocrats have gone after their own families. Nobody's immune to these guys, right? And she says, because they're fanatics. And she gave me a brilliant quote about how they're political fundamentalists and they are their own church. They are the gods of their own religions, which I thought was very, very freaking important. So join us. Uh, do you guys have anything else to say before I sum up this um, report? But, uh, well, Ruth is a national treasure, uh, first of all, and messianic nar narcissism is a hell of a drug. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. 
that that's what we're dealing with with all of these guys who believe that they are in a position to play God, right? To decide for everyone else who dies and who doesn't for what right. purpose, and it always happens to be that their purpose lines up with their own self-interest. Yes, as Ruth has taught us about hiding their corruption. And she's uh, also the 100%. one who's really, she's also, thank you, Jim. She's also the one who taught me about the counter messaging offensive. I'm that That is just something I'm going to be focusing on all year, every damn day. One thing I want to tell you is uh, the night before I saw Ruth, I was re-watching Casablanca, and for those who don't know, Casablanca was filmed in 1942. Very, very gutsy, gutsy film. And one of the key characters in it was the leader of the resistance against the fascists, against the Nazis. And at one point, I got to share this with Ruth because we talk a lot about um, how hard it is to continue to do this work, and yet we have no choice. But I gave her a beautiful quote that I'm gonna share with everybody today when the Humphrey Bogart character asked the head of the resistance uh, if he ever gets tired of doing it. He said, you might as well question why we breathe. If we stop breathing, we'll die. If we stop fighting our enemies, the world will die. Well, here we are again, fighting a new breed of fascists and we can't stop fighting. And people like you and people like Ruth in this fight, you know, I know I'm gonna keep going. So that's it for Front Loaded, guys. Does it matter? Why does it matter? Why high fidelity? First story this week. Your data's out there again. And this comes to us from Bleeping Computer because, hey, a new Microsoft Exchange Zero Day allows data theft attacks. Look, I don't know how many times we've talked about this on this program. Data is important. Data can destroy your company if the wrong data gets out. Data can destroy your personal life if the wrong data gets out. We, these software companies, Microsoft, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, these are data leaks. The data exhaust that people are putting out is causing them to be targeted and it's causing their minds to be broken. I don't know why we don't have regulation to make these software companies step up and secure their products. Maybe we need some sort of tax write-off for expenses on security. I don't know. But I do know that we cannot continue this way when one of the most used email servers in the world is just being torn apart regularly. Yeah, we go, yes, we go back to having had Dr. Charles Creel on uh, who talked about uh, EU and, and UK and we have models we can follow, but we're not. Uh, digital exhaust is an amazing line, by the way. It's it's what it's called. It's it's all the digital tracks that people leave, what likes they have, who they reply to, who they follow, their network. You know what what advertisements do they click on? What self help articles do they read? We right. know that Cambridge Analytica, uh, which is now Emmer Data in the UAE, was collecting all this information on people. So it could manipulate them online politically. Yeah. This is important. People got to understand this. And none of it's past tense. So thank you for that high five. All right. Next story this week, we're going to talk about, yes, Elon Musk is a coward. Aside from being a fucking problem, Elon Musk has decided that he's going to avoid testifying to the SEC in the investigation into how Elon Musk bought 9 to 10% of Twitter and did not report it correctly. We have talked multiple times on this program about how Elon Musk has manipulated markets, how Elon Musk used authoritarian capture with Dana Rohrabacher to get a hold of the United States space program. We have talked about this time and time again. I have a catchphrase. I have a shirt. Elon Musk is a fucking problem. For him to be allowed to exploit our legal system this way is unconscionable. And he has been doing it for at least a decade now. That's why it matters. Jim? Elon Musk 
can't win anything without cheating. He's willing to cheat. So uh, apologies for bringing this around to me. I don't mean this to be about personal grudges, but for the last 10 fucking days, if you search my name on Zitter, what you get is a list of stalkers who are impersonating me and you can't actually find me because he's a giant pussy in addition <laughs> to being uh, an oligarch and a psychopath. So uh, forgive me for my, for my language, but good Lord. Yeah. Well, also and snowflake, um, you can, you can insert snowflake on the top of it. Um, I'm just going to keep all of it. Well, yeah. One thing I want to say is that, um, you know, often when I see these guys, to me, when I see the supervillains, I often say that they seem like they're almost starring in their own hostage videos. Like some of these guys must, you know, be thinking about defenestration. And I got a great quote from Wes Clark Jr. on that, how he thinks with uh, Elon Musk, it could be a leopard eating faces situation. You'll have to look it up if you want to know what he's talking about, but could be, could be that he wants to testify and just simply can't because who knows. All right. Final story this week. We're going to talk Intel inside, outside, upside down. And why are we going to talk about this? Well, it's actually two stories I want to bring up. First one is why Israel slept from the nation. And this is a fascinating story. Uh, it has all sorts of things. Uh, we've discussed on this program how Sheldon Adelson was an unregistered foreign agent for Israel, and uh, people have questioned me on that. Uh, well, it turns out in this article that he was indeed acting as an unregistered foreign agent for Israel, and that he was helping uh, Benjamin Netanyahu take on the uh, BDS movement, which was attempting to hold Israel to account for its racist and barbaric uh, settlement uh, violence in the West Bank. And what happened was Netanyahu decided that he didn't like this movement. So he had intelligence and private intelligence uh, actually start going after people who were part of this movement attempting to hold Israel accountable. And what's absolutely fascinating about this article is uh, that A, Israel's ambassador to the UN has been outed as a spy. And B, a company that makes an appearance in this article uh, is Psy Group, run by Joel Zamel. And this intelligence group was running active measures, psychological operations against Americans on American soil. This is one of our allies. And they have companies in the country who are doing this. And that brings me to the second story this week that I want to talk about. Wait, wait. You, uh, can't, move, you can't go past go ahead. this one. You can't go past this one. All right, we're one. not going to go past this one, Jim. Psy Group. Psy Group is very, 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 very important. So Benjamin Netanyahu, this is really critical, was caught... <laughs> running psychological operations, says right there in the article, approved by Mossad and Benjamin Netanyahu himself, running psychological operations on Americans using Psy Group, which shows up in the Mueller report, which shows up in the Republican Senate Intelligence Committee report on Russian interference, Psy Group ran psychological operations on Americans before the 2016 election. Joel Zamel was in a meeting with Steve Bannon, Eric Prince, Mike Flynn, Don Jr. about creating accounts on social media in order to change people's minds, to inauthentically lie to them, coerce them, and traumatize them into the wrong decision. So the, the company that helped put Trump in office is the same company that Netanyahu is using 
to cover up for something in Gaza. Because he needed, he needed a company that lies for a living, that fear sears, to use an amazing phrase, things into people's minds. That is very important when we start looking at what's happening right now in the Middle East. That same man who, who runs psychological operations on Americans in 2016, and then in order to, to change our minds inauthentically about Palestine, Gaza, we need to understand that the same operation eight fucking years later it's the same people doing the same thing arrest mike flynn that was my hellscape by the way so <laughs> <laughs> no you still got to do a hellscape uh, the second uh, part I, of the I story, thought just that hellscape just popped out right there. So that was yeah. freaking that amazing. Was that, was, that was that was a pre hellscape hellscape. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just the, the, the whole the whole side group thing infuriates me because those motherfuckers are trained by Mossad by Unit eighty two hundred. Look that shit up. It's not some conspiracy theory. Right. It is the real fucking deal inside uh, Israel, and they're and they're deeply corrupt. Yes, so, and and our country deeply uh, suppressed that story. Remember, it was like it the story would break and it'd be like, oh, but it didn't have any impact or, oh, they didn't really go through with it. Nah, bullshit, bullshit. That was under freaking, you know, William Barr, William the Fixer Barr. Um, well, the second part of this story that I want to talk about is about Turkish intelligence. Because as we're seeing around the globe, and that's the thing I really need our audience to do, is kind of step back from the entire world. Look at all these intelligence operations are going on. Because it turns out our ally, a NATO member, Turkey, and President Erdogan, ran operations targeting American military forces in Turkey, threatening them over the Israeli uh, Hamas conflict. Mm -hmm. You have to understand right now at this point in time in our world, the things you see might not be real mm -hmm. because there's a lot of manipulation going on behind the scenes. There's mm -hmm. a lot of intelligence agencies playing games. That's why I called it Intel inside, outside, upside down mm -hmm. because that's why it matters. Thank well, it's funny so much for that. that you bring up Erdogan. Because, as before, and I'm not going to do a, a third hellscape, but if everyone recalls, the uh, Erdogan regime was a significant factor in 2016 in a number of ways. They, he ran a fake color revolution in his own country in order to seize more power using a scapegoat named Fatullah Gulen. And what happened on election day? Mike Flynn writes a hagiography, look that word up, about Erdogan. He's calling him a great leader and we need to be his friend and all of that. And smearing Fatullah Gulen, who it was, it was reported by James Woolsey, former director of the CIA, that Mike Flynn, Mike Flynn Jr., and a bunch of other assets from Flynn Intel Group were planning with the Turkish government to kidnap Fatullah Gulen from inside the United States and take him back to Turkey. Arrest Mike Flynn. Sorry, that was my third hellscape. <laughs> Uh, you guys rock. I knew it was going to happen. That was amazing. I knew it was going to happen. Uh, it hey, you know what we're going to do now? You got to do another. Jim Stewart's in hellscape. Oh, fuck. All right. I want to talk about the fact that um, we have somebody who believes in his heart 
that the United States government needs to be taken over by a Christian cult in order for the end times to happen, in order for Jesus to come down to Jerusalem to pick all the people who are saved up. Right? If you're not familiar, and you probably are, but there is a strain of apocalyptic biblical Christianity that has twisted the New Testament around to make it imperative that Christians take over Jerusalem, take over the, the government of the United States, in order to bring about the tribulation which precedes the end times. This is, first of all, you have to cherry pick specific things from the New Testament, which is fan fiction, I'm sorry, of the Old Testament. You cherry pick some stuff and and agree to argue about a specific piece of land in the Middle East. Right? That, that that's that there is a strain of of people that believe that. Um and it, it's a cult. I'm gonna just put it right out there. Um if you if you believe this particular thing, it is on the order of flat earth. Right? You have to disbelieve your own eyes and ears. The problem is that we have an entire infrastructure that's setting up around us, that's creating events to replicate this fan fiction and this twisted narrative that's been generated by by evangelicals um, for 40 years, right? There's been a project, you can take it all the way back, but 40 years ago-ish, there there began by the oil and gas industry, shockingly, and a bunch of, of, you know, fascists uh, to create this strain of apocalyptic Christianity, which makes it seem like the heating of the earth is amazing, right? Like... Think about that. Why is it that so many evangelicals think that climate change is a hoax? They don't think it's a hoax at all. They want it. That's the dirty secret. I'll tell you another dirty secret that I've told you before, but maybe I haven't heard it yet. The Republican Party's support for Israel is about as anti-Semitic as it gets. Because the secret is that we support Israel because the because in this weird interpretation of the Bible, the Christians have to fight the Muslims first, defeat the Muslims, and then Jesus, when we when we've occupied Israel to protect them to protect the poor Jews in Israel, then Jesus will come down. But guess what? Jesus isn't going to pick up the Jews. He's just going to pick up the Christians. Just the people who are saved to believe in this particular piece of fan fiction. Right? Those are only people growing up. So underneath this entire LARP, this entire alternate reality game that they've created is the death of everyone except them. With a particular emphasis on not the Jews. So going back to how I started this, a man who fully embraces this, not only fully embraces this mythology, this genocidal anti-Semitic bullshit, 
He's in a cult called Seven Mountains Dominionism that identifies all of the aspects of human life, entertainment, religion, politics, media, everything. Identifies seven mountains. And in each of these mountains, they are literally running psychological operations intentionally, knowingly. Uh, manipulating media to push the these Christian soldiers into positions where they can effectuate the mission. The mission being to make the United States a Christian country. By Christian country, I don't mean a Christian democratic country at all. Theocracy. So, again, this weaselly little fuck who is now the Speaker of the House is a Seven Mountains Dominionist who believes that the United States government needs to be replaced by his cult. That's where we are right now. Two heartbeats. I, I promise you this. They, there are people thinking real hard about the fact that there's only two heartbeats between Mike Johnson and the presidency. This, this is the game that's being played right now. There are there the the dark un infrastructure that has been in many ways masked by religion and is now being weaponized is coming right up to the top. And all, all of us need to really, really get it that if we lose, if we lose this, Gilead is looks like a picnic. We already have in the newspaper today, Donald Trump says he's going to invoke the Insurrection Act on day one to quell all the protests that he's sure are going to follow. In order to wreak revenge on his opponents from the Justice Department, two of, two of Donald Trump's top people are suing me for $10 million. Guess who's going to prison? So, look. Um, I have said before, I'm an atheist, but I respect your beliefs. I don't give a shit what you think. I love you anyway. It doesn't matter. I don't care. But if you, if your beliefs are endangering my kids, your beliefs are the problem. Arrest Mike Flynn. Powerful stuff, Jim, as usual. And um, it's important to note that the majority of Americans don't want any of this. They can only win by cheating. They can only bring this upon us by cheating. And somebody who knows a lot about that, our good friend Monique Kamara, geopolitical analyst, co-host of Kremlin File, and the producer of Europhile, which curates very important news from Europe and around the world, particularly as it relates to Russia's assault on democracy, Russia's assault on psych psychological, um, the psychology of the world, essentially. And we're going to bring Monique in because she's going to 
bring us some of the most important stories that we need to know about. But we're also going to start talking about psychological disarmament, truth and unity, and how we go on a counter offensive with our messaging. So let's bring Monique in. Monique Kamara, we are so grateful to have you back with us today. Uh, it's very important to this team that we don't turn away from the war in Ukraine because that is all of our war. And that is why we had Paul Conroy on last week, Serena Zabriskie the week before that. It's yeah. very, very important that we do not uh, look away. And I was very happy to hear about Jim's new ringtone, which was President Zelensky's uh, comment today on Meet the Press. Which uh, which was great. If only we could find the uncensored version, but I'm sure uh, you guys can come up with something. Um, but uh, if, if so, anyone missed it, it yeah, Zelensky called Putin a fucking terrorist. Yeah, um, they had to bleep it, <laughs> and they bleeped it, which so I mean, come on, like like how how much horrible shit do they say all the time? You know? Yeah, exactly. Let, let one F bomb go through. We, we can fix it with AI. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned to our um, audience in your introduction, your Europhile is just such an incredibly important clearinghouse of information, uh, mostly daily. And I read every single word and I learn so much. And then I'm able to report what I've learned from you to our audience, such as Moldova making the decision to uh, shut down 31 Russian propaganda sites. Like that is something I learn from reading Europhile that I might have missed in the flood of shit that obscures the important information. So since not everybody has the time or the bandwidth to read, you know, all the footnotes uh, coming from uh, Europe, I really would like you to start with what you think are some of the most important stories that uh, our global audience should know in order of whatever you feel is most important but what are some of the you know top five six you know things that yeah. we must uh, not look away from okay so with um Europhile that has different there are different things on it but every day Heidi as you were saying there's you no know, the aggregator I put in news from different areas so what's going on in Ukraine the combat situation what's going on in Russia at that time and then also allied support and I've added a section on world news because of what is happening, okay, uh, in Israel, uh, you know, with the war against Hamas. So, and I try to include as well an article that could be useful, some sort of uh, video on YouTube that I think, you know, could uh, enhance whatever knowledge that we need to know uh, to understand certain situations. Now, in this period, um, what is happening in Ukraine, there are two things. The first is that all of the focus is now towards, well, there are two areas, two main areas. The first is in Crimea, and that is where they are trying to degrade all of Russian capabilities on Crimea, all of the different, uh, let's say, the shipyards. For example, last night, you'll find in the next e-stories, last night, okay, they... Um, they destroyed a shipyard. Why the shipyard? And these are also some of the little notes that I put in because it takes a lot longer to uh, rebuild a shipyard, okay, instead of other kinds like missiles you can build or you can get them out. But the shipyard that you need to service uh, boats and also, you know, for the troops and stuff like that, this is takes a lot longer. So what are they trying to do um, with all of this activity in you know, all of the attacks that they've managed to do with drones, for example, and all that kind of thing is to push force, okay? It's my dog. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, we'll have interruptions, okay, from my dog, Rudy, who just loves anytime I get on a call, that's it. He's over here with his, with his bone and everything. We love puppies and babies, yes. <laughs> I was talking about Crimea. Just to you know, uh, be very brief there, the whole strategy is to make sure to get the Russians to move their kit going towards the east. The farther that they can do that, the less those missiles can be shot over into southern, southeastern Ukraine. 
So that's the idea there. So watch out because they're getting hit every day with more and more and more missiles. So that's the strategy there because the key to this whole thing, to the whole war is Crimea. There's no other way. And it's got to be liberated militarily. It can't be done. They're, the Russians will never give it up because it's too important geostrategically for them, the location of it. So uh, that's why Crimea must become Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Must return. Must okay? return to Ukraine. So their borders, they're looking at borders, uh, 1991 borders. That's the key there. Okay? Yeah. In the south, unfortunately, in areas like Abdivka, this is where there's a huge, right now, one of the biggest land battles ever fought. And um, the, there are a lot of Ukrainians dying. I hate to report this, but there are many more Russians dying. Okay. Um, and what they need there, there's a lot of things that they need. I know that in the news, for example, the narrative that they're pushing right now for Ukraine is negotiations, okay, uh, which is false. It's a false uh, narrative. We all know, everybody on this call knows that when the Russians talk about negotiations, peace, disarmament, so on and so forth, that is not what they mean. They, right. it's, it's the opposite, okay? Yeah. So this is why we have to be very, very careful. I don't know who's pushing it, okay? Like NBC came out with something, but it's there's a lot of, lot of um, outlets right now that are coming out with this kind of narrative. No, it's not going to go. High five. I just, I, I need to explain to people, you know, they talk about ceasefires. They talk mm. about, oh, we got to stop the war. Um, all you're doing is giving Russia a chance to stop, regroup, rearm retool and yep. that is that cannot be done yep. like ukraine they've needs done to press this, yeah they've done this one thing that everybody needs to know this strategy was set out by the soviets in 1956 they have been following this strategy ever since so um, and, and give and, us give us a simple sentence on what the strategy is because i'm really working on counteroffensive messaging so so give us a really simple thing that people mm -hmm. can plant in their heads um, what can I say? Whatever they say, okay, be it peace talks, it's not peace talks. Yes. It's peace talks for them only. It is yeah. not a mutual. Yes. They, there's never a mutual agreement. Whenever right. they go into agreements, anytime they're, they sit at a table, it is simply for whatever they can get, short term or long term. Let's remember another thing. The Russians think in the long term. Yeah, It could be that's why a ceasefire to them is what Hi-Fi is saying, because then they're just going to attack again. Right. That's the basics. Okay. Right. Thank so you. Absolutely right, Hi-Fi. Absolutely. What's happening and now in Russia instead, they're recruiting. Okay. Wagner is back recruiting. Okay. And the economy, they're having problems with the economy as always, but that yeah. doesn't really it doesn't have an impact on Russian people themselves because they don't think that way. It affects us, but it doesn't affect them. Okay. The, the actual, you know, um, citizens themselves, medicines are running low. There's um, a really spike 100% increase in hepatitis A, B, and C, for example. Wow. Yeah, no, there's some, and so, so grim. So grim. They're, they're exporting gold, which is not a good sign. Okay. What, one more thing I want to say before you move on, Monique, back to your shipyards and why that strategy is so important. I want everybody to remember Russian warship, go fuck yourself. Don't forget. <laughs> don't forget. The Moskva, are... It started with the Moskva and it's going to end in that area in the Black Sea. Right. The Black Sea is really fundamental. People don't pay attention to it, but that's where it is. The, it will liberate the pressure that the Ukrainian forces are now feeling in the south because it will cut off supplies. Right. That's how the Russians supply their forces in the south. You cut off Crimea, you make it difficult for them to keep it and expensive for them to keep it, lose their capabilities, degrade everything that they have, and they won't be able to resupply okay, their troops in the southeast which is where you know, they need to liberate, all right? They already have a little bit of a foothold on the left side, okay, of the Nipro. So that's really important. And that will, and it takes time. These things take time. They got entrenched in there 
So, you know, we have to be realistic and say, okay, this it's going to take time. Jim so had a question. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just wanted I just wanted to make a comment that uh, the Black Sea is indeed uh, the most important strategic element here, which is why Elon Musk shut off Starlink over the Black Sea, is That's because right. that the the more information the Ukrainians have about how and who is bombing them and where they are, um, you know, the the better it is for Ukraine. Um, and as we know, Vatniks. Uh, around the world don't want that. I also just briefly, if I may, from a personal standpoint, the reason why Crimea is in Russian hands in the first place is because the United States let its guard down while Mike Flynn was ahead of the Defense Intelligence Agency in 2014, after which he got fired by Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Apologies for putting in my little two cents there. <laughs> no, uh, I know what to do, Jim. You know what to do, Jim? If yeah. we all widen the lens, look at the geographic position of the Black Sea and Crimea. That is at the mouth of a whole area. That's a whole sea lane that goes down, okay, to where we're seeing now. Um, let's see. You would have to go through the Suez Canal, and then you're, you're basically um, looking at... Israel and Egypt, okay, it's at the mouth of Egypt. So th that's a whole sea lane there. And that's what a lot of people, whenever you look at these things, look at it geographically to understand the importance. Another thing too, in the north part of the, uh, the Crimea, okay, sorry, the north part of the Black Sea, um, that's controlled now by the Russians. But the Black Sea is also an area where there is heightened criminal activity because of trafficking, human trafficking, yes. drugs and arms. Yes. They control that and they want to keep that. OK, so let's remember, it's not just the Russians. We're talking Russian mob, OK, that control those sea lanes and you know, all of the imports, exports. And it's fundamental that that area goes back into Ukrainian hands, NATO hands, OK, because that's the whole area. It's stability in the whole area. Look at Moldova and look at, OK, they're getting lobbed over to with missiles. All right. In their port areas more than anything. But that's the that's the thing there. I saw the Zelensky interview on Meet the Press and I hated that they focused so much on Trump because, uh, you know, we should be working <laughs> on something else. OK, right. Let's right. get that. Make, make no. the press is lost that their first yeah. interview was Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You're absolutely was, right. I forgot about that. Can, can, now, can the, we, in, mm -hmm. one, one quick thing, going yeah. back to the grimness, the grim reality of life yeah. in Russia, I think it's very important. Um, Keir Giles, when we had him on the show, who wrote Russia's War on Everybody, talked about why there was such a willingness to embrace uh, messianism, like, a, you know, thinking that they are some sort of uh, special people. It's like, if you focus on the reality, <laughs> which is what you just said, which is like, you know, heightened disease and poverty. And we know so much of the country doesn't even have indoor plumbing. What else do you have, but some sort Nothing. of magical thinking that you're you a special what? person? Heidi, think of all the people that live in these areas. Okay. 65% of the Russian population outside of the urban areas do not have indoor plumbing. So they got to go outside to do their, their stuff, okay? If you think of that, if you live in one of these poverty-stricken areas, okay, and when I say poverty, I mean they don't have water at home, okay? They got to go out and get it. If you live in an area like that and you get recruited to go to the front lines, okay, it's, it's a step up, babe. That's the whole thing. And they don't care. They don't care if they get killed, they're like, okay, my family will get maybe get some money or something. That's the way they are. And they've been this way. Remember, the Russians throw masks at everything. Yeah. There are only certain pockets inside Moscow and certain in St. Petersburg, not all of them, by the way, little pockets of really elite Russian people who are businessmen. They work in energy, they work in IT, they work in uh, all of the derivatives, like on the stock exchange. Those are the people with money. Everybody else, the average cost, the average wage in St. Petersburg is $600. Uh -huh. That's it per month. Okay. So you've got pockets of these people inside. Uh -huh. Everybody else, look at what happened in Dagestan. Uh -huh. Look at Dagestan. Dagestan, the people in Dagestan have been protesting 
for the past year because the gasoline prices have skyrocketed in Russia and they keep protesting. Dagestan, they're, they're very... Um, they're very anti-establishment. They have a lot of problems in the area. But it's not just there. The wow. big, I think, where we're going to see a, a bit more instability inside Russia is in the regional areas. In the, the heads of the regions are tired of having to uh, fund a war, send their men, yeah. and they're getting, you know, emptied out. All right. And it's no benefit to them whatsoever. No yeah. benefit to them. So Thank this you. is where we're going to see those pockets, okay, of, uh, let's say, instability. That It's going to increase. All right? Thank you for that. I just think it's really important that we remind people of that. Yes, Jim. I just wanted to, since you brought up Dagestan, yep. um, there was an incident at an airport in Dagestan. Yeah, that's what it's that is. was intentionally modeled, uh, in my view, after pogroms, after the Russian pogroms. They uh, a whole bunch of, of people um, uh, came rushing into the airport um, onto the tarmac, threatening to kill all the Jews on the plane. Mm -hmm. um, and they were not Jewish. What's that? They, were, they, were, they weren't Jewish. They were kids coming back from treatments on cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 regardless, right? The, the point the point was to to show yep. a exactly what you're talking about that yep. sort of instability and 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 hatred um, in, inside the, the country. I just wanted to bring that up because yep. as as my grandparents were forced out of Russia in the pogroms a century. Oh, wow, ago. Jim! Wow. So, so what I see programs in Russia, I'm just like, wow, holy shit. Um, yeah. You know, here we go yeah. again. Yeah. High five. I, I, I have a question. And, and the cognitive dissonance of the evangelical Americans in the United States who would mm -hmm. support Russia in their war against Ukraine, yet support Israel's actions in Gaza, like how do they not see that Hamas is working with Putin and Netanyahu will take a call with Putin, but he doesn't want to talk to Zelensky? Like how is this how is this not obvious? How, is this how is it playing out in Europe? How is it playing out in Europe? Oh well right now, in fact I was gonna bring up because Jim had brought up what happened, you know, in Dagestan and stuff. Um, at this moment, we are seeing an explosion of protest movements all over. All right. Okay. This weekend, there was a big one. It will continue next week. And it is polluting all of the information space, distracting completely from what really counts, okay, uh, in terms of the dialogue we need to have. Continuing on Ukraine, but also in the area, you know, uh, let's say between the Israelis and the Palestinians, what has happened. Uh, with the Arab world, okay, as well, because nobody is bringing them into the equation. They're not coming into the equation. They don't want to, but they should be pressured to. There are different ways of resolving, okay, situations. But let me get back to the protests. What we're seeing now is a complete explosion of narratives that we've traced back to the 50s in Russia. Okay? Yeah. They right. have co-opted. Let's remember one thing, and it's true. Thank I mean, you for saying that. At, of course. Well, if you look at, God. you know, in London, which group it was that took over the, the protests in London? Okay, I've been listening to the radio in the UK. I'm listening to whatever is it, just to see what they're saying. In London, it was co-opted by Stop the War. Uh -huh. We know that Stop the War was in Washington, D.C., okay, pushing Assange, and pushing, okay, all of the other anti during Ukraine, during, okay, they with were Russian flags. disarmament, <laughs> and here we get back, disarmament for the Soviets and for the Russians, what does it mean? You disarm so that my arm, so I can, you know, have a better position, right? That's it. That's disarmament. But what How they think is that Russia was going to, why? I, that's uh, Heidi. How you know do people not see it? It's indoctrination for years and wow. years and years and years. I can talk about Italy because I know in Austria, Germany, 
France, Spain. This is the, the narrative that they use because for them, it went back to the 1950s, as I said, where they actively took over, okay, a cultural, they weaponized cultural diplomacy. That's what they ended up doing in those years. They did it in the States, by the way. They managed to get the, the Americans to disarm on their part while the Russians went forward. They signed a treaty, but it was all bogus because they went forward with their, with their program anyway. I would just like to give a little, just to tell you how detrimental that is. When Reagan got in, okay, the, uh, and Gorbachev was still in office, right? Uh, the Russians were ahead in weapons development, okay? Not the Americans at that time, the Russians, because this is how they managed to disarm. It's a psychological disarmament as well. That's what you're doing to the population. All of those protests, okay? Because I know it's not, it's not very nice to say that you need weapons, but you need them to defend your nation. And we see in Ukraine, you know how that went. OK, um, but anyway, this is uh, this is a thing. Uh, high fire. I have no idea how they square it in the sense that I think it's just based on religion. It's just that, you know, uh, it's a religious vein. That's what it is. I mean, so it's OK for the extremist Christians to treat to team up with the extremist Muslims to kill Jewish people, I guess. Is. <laughs> well, sure. So, it goes back to an anti-Semitism. We know that the basis, right? right? right. That's what they did. Kind of, they co-opted it and turned it into an anti-Semitic. Okay, absolutely. Yes. And can, you know what? Good intending people. I know people on both sides. Okay, I have tons and tons of Jewish friends yes. who my heart goes out to. But I can also see that maybe that should have been handled in a different way. All right, than what they're doing now. Um, but I feel, I feel for, for the whole situation, but it's really, really difficult to solve. They're in a perfect storm. Right. That whole thing is in a perfect storm. So right? before we go on, psychological yep. disarmament. Oh my God. It's, I've been trying to find words. Tactic. I've been trying to find tactic. words. I've been trying to find words because we see these staged horror events and then we watch people yep. allow themselves to be manipulated yep to benefit Russia. Okay, can we also make one thing extremely clear? The videos that are coming out are there, and Jim, you've said it, High Five, you said it, and Heidi, you've said this before, are there to traumatize. That's what they're there for. A lot of the videos that we're seeing are actual videos from Syria, not from Gaza. Yeah. Okay? There are some that are real, and I can't tell you which ones are. Because I haven't had time to sit down, do O's and right. look at it. I mean, there are people that are trying to work on this stuff, okay? But a lot of the videos are coming out, and they're from Syria, all right? That's where they're from. And a lot of people, we don't know. They've just decided to co-opt it, and that's it, to traumatize people, to get you to look at that, and not the greater pictures of what we were saying before. What's being done, right? That's what needs to be discussed. And uh, there Jim, was some Jim, jump in. Well, we're going to keep, we're gonna, we're gonna keep interrupting you. We're going to keep interrupting you. Just get, just get <laughs> it's a real it. term, by the way, in psychological okay. warfare. They do it on okay. purpose. Yeah. I, I'm okay, Jim. I just wanted to, before we jump past religion as the, you know, um, sort of the underlying <laughs> factor here, right? I mean, it in the last, since the attack on Israel, right? All of a sudden now, and not all of a sudden, it's been thousands of years, but the religious underpinnings of all of it has come to the surface. And I just want to remind our viewers at the end of the day, we're talking about 3000 year old fiction, I'm sorry, about events that people interpret in different ways where they believe that a strip of land, you know, in the in the middle of the Middle East is worth dying for. Um, and we have a, an extremist Christian biblical apocalyptic nut job, third in line to the presidency, right? While Jews and Muslims 
are murdering each other and hating each other and running psychological operations to make more hate against mm -hmm. each other. Well, the dominionist Christians in the United States dominate the Supreme Court, now dominate the House, um, and, and, you know, we're all victims of this ancient fiction, and we just need to fucking get over it. <laughs> it's, it, the, 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 this, the religion is just being used as a weapon. And and it breaks my fucking oh, definitely. heart. Definitely, definitely. I'd like to ask. So much I'd... real suffering comes yeah. from, you know. And, and it's not it's not a, to be against religion as a whole or against people's faith. Um, but when that faith ends up murdering people, it's it's time to reconsider. Yeah. Well, let's also make clear that what we're seeing with Hamas is not religion. That yeah. is that is radical Islam. It's a cult. It's a, it's a different death thing. Cult. No, it's a terrorist group. Okay. Uh, it's a, well, it's a death cult. That's what they're doing. Terrorists. Okay. Yes. They have they have put their own people in peril, which they don't give a shit about. Uh we know that they are Well, I, I believe that was part of the intent though. Oh well of part, course it is. Uh, yes. Of yes. course it is. They yes. wouldn't be doing what they're doing if they they um, they wouldn't be using human shields unless it was going to be effective, and yes. it is. Okay, yes. that's that's the the let's say the uh, the basis of it. Um, Hamas, like uh, Hezbollah, I mean we've we've heard these okay uh, these terrorist groups. Uh, they're you know they are not operating. They, they're they don't represent an ideology. They simply represent okay their uh, terror. It's a terrorist group that wants to get power. That's basically it. The Hamas leaders, all of the leaders of the Palestinians, they're not even in Gaza. They're not even there. They're, they're in Syria. They're in, Qatar, they're in Qatar. They're in Doha. They're in Dubai. This is where they are. Yeah. Okay. The head of the Hamas, the guy that goes on TV, five billion dollars. The guy has, and he's he he doesn't live there. All right. He's on TV, and that's about it. Right. Uh, so they don't give a shit, all right? They actually don't give a shit. That's why it's a it's a really sticky thing. But I wanted to get back um, to, um, let's say, one thing that happened here in Italy, and I think it's something to keep an eye on. The uh, two Russian, I, I mean, I call them agents because they are agents, but they have oh. a TV program in Russia on the main channel. They got this TV program. Uh, I learned uh, today because the guy that had the slot, okay, um, I can't remember his name right now. He's a comedian and he was against the war. So they got rid of him, right? And he's had, he had to flee, okay, to the West. And now these two have taken this TV show and they do, they do so-called prank calls, all right? They've right. called, they've managed to breach the security um, of many, okay, many uh, leaders, including Merkel, for example, Stoltenberg, a whole bunch of people, and they did Maloney, okay, on September the 18th. Oh, yes. Now, this is already her second hit because her husband, there was uh, audios that were released about him um, and his disgusting, uh, let's say, um, behavior okay on the set because he's a tv personality mm -hmm. uh those were leaked and but but they had already left each other many months before so this was done to embarrass her once again then these two okay they do this phone call purporting to be the head of the african union uh, obviously, there's somebody inside the Italian in, in her office or in the Italian security. I don't know exactly how the dynamics, like exactly who calls whom, how it's vetted, so on and so forth. But somebody screwed up or it's a mole that she has inside. Okay, we just don't have enough information to be able to say this is how it went. Um, what was the result of this? Extreme embarrassment. Okay, for her. And second, she had she had to. I don't know why, but um, her head of the diplomatic, okay, her diplomatic office, who is a an Atlanticist, a staunch Atlanticist, 
uh, he was fired over this. Okay. So this again, so she's uncovered. All right. In that position, he was someone who had very, very close ties to the Biden administration. And as I said, staunch Atlanticist in NATO. So, and she trusted him. Okay. So basically, this is what, okay, what they managed to do. And this was Russian intelligence. This is an operation, again, to make sure that she's unstable. And in fact, on the Italian press, what are we starting to see now? Well, maybe she's not as great as everybody says she is. And they may revisit her position. And again, Italy is not a big economic player, but it is in NATO and it is a founding member of the EU. Right. And you start having problems where at least, okay, there, it was very strong. All right. Jim uh, and Hi-Fi, I think uh, Hi-Fi we brought up before Kosovo and what is going on in Serbia, you know, before our call. The more that the Russians can destabilize internally in the EU and distract them with problems, the better it is for Russia. Because it means that you have to use that energy to go and put out fires. Just like, for example, the little farmers protest in in Poland. What the hell is that about? And the Polish government has to, no, uh, give, um, let's say, attention to that. So What's this, is, in Serbia? this is I mean, really, really, really important. And I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but we're going to no, keep no, no, interrupting no. you. Listen, we talked about this earlier. Russia's winning the information war because we continually lurch from crises to crises. And too many yep. people don't see that this is part of the infection of active measures and hybrid warfare. So you bring up the protests, the mobs. I tried to explain to somebody uh, last night that Mm -hmm. what I see are Tatushki mobs everywhere. I see a bunch of people maybe inflamed by some Facebook group. And who did we find out were behind the Facebook groups in 2016? Fucking Russia. They keep on using the same playbook and people are like, oh, this is really terrible that, you know, uh, kids think all these horrible things. It's like, I just feel like we're losing the information war the frontier is the internet and we have no defenses. And yeah. uh, from what you're telling me, it's global, mm-hmm. obviously. It's global. It's absolutely global. Um, Where's the, the response? The Where response is, the it's response? a huge, and that's, well, that's, it's a huge problem that we have because in this situation, um, I can tell you that the problem is, is because we are reacting and not acting. Yeah, that's that's the the thing. And the media, the media, okay, with its model, let's say there are those who are fellow travelers, there are those who are, no, I'm not going to put everybody in the same boat, because then at that point, the real assholes, we can't, you know, find out who they are. But you have those who are opportunists, those who are fellow travelers, those who are real uh, shills, okay, who are actually paid by Moscow. So um, unfortunately, the media has to step up, step up its game, and I don't know how to get them to do that because well, uh, in 2016, the... they, they caused half of the problem. Well, right? and also they're continuing that in 2023. Jim just posted exactly. today uh, who was chosen to be leading the Washington Post. Too much of the media is owned by billionaires who bet on fascism. The just to be clear, Jeff Bezos, who owns the fucking Washington Post, yeah. put. A Murdoch guy, a guy who worked for Rupert Murdoch, the most damaging propagandist maybe in history. Yeah. Uh, they put Ooh, a guy was... who worked for that uh, in charge of the Washington, my home, and, and it's personal to me. Sorry, it's so personal for me today. But the way I grew up right outside D.C., I grew up doing the fucking jumble in the back of the Washington Post in the cartoon section. And this motherfucker puts a murder, Murdoch guy in, in, in charge of, of the Post. It's just despicable. Just crazy. Who was the Murdoch guy who got busted in Greece for uh, evading sanctions? For- no, he got busted in London. Jack Hannock, who was a Hannity oh, yeah. uh, producer who... Bravo. Oh, hopefully has something uh, to trade, uh, you know, up with. But 
Yeah, no, it's that's why it's so important to me that we focus on the counter offensive of messaging, you know, the, yeah. the messaging counter offensive. Yeah. That is what my my goal and that is. has to be. In fact, I put down two words good okay, that are essential. All right. Going forward. And this has to be done, unfortunately, because the media is not doing it. We got to do it. There's nobody yeah, else. That's right. We have to step up and do it. Unity. Because the first thing that these people want to do is atomize us. Put us all separate because when you atomize, and that's exactly what the Russians did, the Soviets did, for all of their existence, you atomize uh, a society and they cannot unite to resist. We can't okay. defend ourselves that way. Exactly. Yeah. So unity first. Yeah. So for example, if you're on the left, try to talk to other people and say, look, okay, you don't like, you know, that Biden has taken this position with the, with Israel. You've got to get beyond it, okay, because there's too much at stake in the next election. There mm -hmm. simply is too much. If the left if the left goes into different directions, it's lost. Yeah. They win automatically. Yeah. So this is extremely important, and it's, you know, unfortunately I can't use the same strategy here because the left is part of the whole problem. Okay, okay. so we're really fucked. Uh, <laughs> truth. <laughs> Which is, well, I mean, the, we, we got lots of yeah, yeah. on the left here. Yeah. I mean, you got yeah. the whole the whole Jimmy Dore kind of wing of fucking the left, which is just, it's just No, but they're taking over the protests. You literally see. just MAGA, right? The same right? Julian Assange, yeah. uh, you know, Free Snowden. These Who motherfuckers come out here with this pretend, you know, they pretend yeah. that it's about pre press freedom. But it's about making sure that a, a guy who can flip on literally everybody, every Russian asset in America, uh, you know, they, they don't want him free. And so the Russians are over here infiltrating the left and using their touchy feely emotions to to make him a victim. And they, they just it is a pattern. Yes, I'm and we afraid. Need to stop. Yes. For it. RFK Jr. We can go on and on. What I'm afraid yeah. of is that Americans are not going to see it until the bombs are already overhead. And yeah. that is what my goal is to get them to see it. Yeah. All Americans yeah. before the bombs are yeah. overhead and whether they're. And you know what, Heidi, I mean, I follow you. And what I really appreciate about the stuff that you guys write is that it is grounded in truth. Everything that has that needs to be put out there needs to be grounded in fact and truth. Unity and truth. That's the two things that they are trying to completely destroy. So it's the only way that you can counter it. For example, the Maloney thing, she made a huge error of coming out with, right, high five with these stupid excuses. She should have been extremely clear. This is a Russian operation. Yeah. It was run like this. I'm looking into my security people to see who fucked up and they will get fired. I'm going forward in Ukraine and I'm going forward in, in uh, all of the alliances and our obligations. Yeah. And that's it. This is how it but happened. She, and she, she sacrificed a patsy, though. She sacrificed, she sacrificed a guy who was strong. No, he's them. an important person because yeah. he was not a patsy. The Italian admin no, he was. Someone that was extremely important. Russia won two times that way. Yeah. She was humiliated globally. And two, mm -hmm. she's lost a precious advisor yeah. who had links. He's been on everything. He was he was Italy's ambassador to NATO. So he knows everybody in NATO. Okay. This was this is absolutely horrible. So that's why she she played this. I don't know why she did it that way, but it was. Um, it was a huge mistake. When anything happens, we have to press our people, tell us what happened. Because that way they can't use it against you. If, so, you, if you have come up with it and you put it out there, yeah. then it, everybody knows what the what the real version is. And, and people, people generally can handle the truth. The issue I have, and this is fresh on my mind because I just wrote about Alex Jones. And that is that the conspiracy, mm. you know, brain weasels that go in people's heads, make them think they know the truth or some sort of magical truth that's not the truth. So we also have to 
somehow flatten uh, con the conspiracy uh, theories, you know, basically somehow mm -hmm. um, cut out that cancer because right now we are, uh, to quote frontline, the United States of conspiracy, which is not unusual in the run up to fascism to get people not to believe their eyes and ears. So somehow we need to also um, mm -hmm. elim eliminate, you know, that component. And again, that is something that I'm putting thought in as far as how to counter message all of that. And if you can't see the brutality in going after grieving parents who lost their children in gun violence, then, yeah. then I, then I don't think you're human. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's uh, it's it's right now is a real mess and it's going to get worse Jesus simply Christ. because as the totalitarian yeah. powers, China, Iran, Russia, uh, Russia and China being the two of the largest, as they go forward and Russia, especially when it begins to, to lose control of different areas, economic, political, social, so on and so forth, which will happen. Um, they will turn more and more to proxy wars, right? And I think I, I wrote to you, Heidi, about this. They will turn more and more to proxy wars outside of their borders in order to validate their own state. Okay. Okay. That's the way it works. So this is what we're going to be seeing. And there will be an increase in this, not a decrease. And it'll be small just like Israel, Hamas, it'll be another, you know, area will flare up someplace else. And this will, okay, uh, distract us on one side. And on the other, it always gives the Russian leader that or the Chinese leader or Iran, because Iran, look, inside it's a shit show in Iran too. They're mm -hmm. like economically destroyed, okay, inside. But they need these battles outside to legitimize their, their regimes, that's the way, you know, that's the way they do it. So it's, it's, so it's going to be I rough. Need, I, I, need you is coming. I need you to explain proxy wars to our viewers in a nice, tight summary because Ooh. people are still lurching from crises to crises and not seeing it as part of a bigger play. So, so explain what a proxy war is and why we need to be a lot more sophisticated in our yeah. thinking. Well, Russia does not... Uh, doesn't have the resources, okay, to take on American influence or NATO or other, you know, uh, powerful alliances. So it will fund, as it's done since, you know, since like when they even just started in 1917, uh, they will fund other groups outside, okay? They will fund uh, terrorist groups, which is what they've been doing, um, again, for the past 100 years, um, they will fund these groups in order to start a war indirectly, right, with the United States and with all of the other alliance members. That's the way, okay, that's, that's what they're doing. Israel, Hamas, now, I can't say that it's Russia's war, all right, but it's really convenient for them, really convenient for them. Uh, and and a lot just, of people just, don't uh, see it that a, way, but thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you Hamas, for that. Hamas met with Vladimir Putin six months before the attack. Yeah, no, Hamas I know. Hamas received yeah. forty-one million dollars in cryptocurrency. Yeah, uh, leading up to the attack. Um, uh, Netanyahu, uh, Jim, go back. You Netanyahu, know what Hamas Netanyahu, has been. Netanyahu mm -hmm. and Likud propped up. Hamas, Netanyahu, and Likud are allied with Putin. It's, it's super clear to me that what's happening here is that Putin it needs Ukraine to be distracted from and has been uh, putting the pieces in place to create a, a holy war in the Middle East because it, it helps him because it creates this multipolar world that he's looking for right he wants to say oh the united states is just this one place look at all of these poles right yeah. that's his whole strategy it's yeah. to your to your point before about atomizing mm -hmm. he's atomizing the world yeah. <laughs> right? and, and well they want to the russians too their yeah. whole ideology is everybody's going to become like russia 
That's God. basically it. I can I can give you that. That's that's like that's basic, basic. But uh, just to uh, maybe add to your point, Jim, um, Iran has been funding Hamas since 1984-85. So we're not talking about right, and they've. Hamas and the Iranians, more than anything, have been um, at war with the West. Absolutely. War since then. Okay. We Hezbollah, know right? It's were, all, it, oh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, but a whole bunch Hamas. of them. You go to the Houthis in Yemen, for and example. They, the right? Houthis, the Palestinian yeah. Islamic Jihad. Yeah. Um, now, this, you know, yeah, this particular. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, this particular it's, it's, it's Wagner for It's all Wagner for Iran, right? So yeah. what well, I this wish... particular uh, just to finish off just this particular operation uh, there's a great report in memory which is from Iran and they came out and said that they started preparations in 2019 mm -hmm. that's when they started for yeah. this particular okay operation so that's why I'm a bit hesitant in saying um, they obviously Russia knew about it. Okay, probably did not know for operational purposes exactly when, where, what. Um, but all they, you know what, they don't even have to. No. They don't even have to have those details. No. They've been funding you forever. You know exactly what to do. Hitler didn't have to sign anything. He didn't have to make a phone call. His henchmen knew exactly what they had to do. That's the way these things. You know, what work. I would li like to contribute to this part of the conversation is I would very much like for us to make it less easy for Very these villains, good. these super villains to, to enact these types of attacks. We can make it less easy by going back to your point on unity. We are so easily divided. We are so easily inflamed. We've trained to be outrage junkies and being divided only helps the super villains. So how do we make it less easy? I, I would very much like people to think about that uh, mm -hmm. in their own worlds as they listen to this. Stop making it so fucking easy for these supervillains to manipulate, divide us, and, uh, you know, further uh, their totalitarian goals. Yep. Um, to not make it easy, I mean, it's actually, it has to be taken in, in different aspects, okay? We're in the information war, so it's our responsibility, since we know what we're doing and we understand what's at stake, to step up, okay? Yeah. Militarily, yeah. that's out of our, our purview. And that, the only thing we can say is keep supporting Ukraine, ask our people to do that. Those are the ones, okay? In politics, because remember, this is, um, when we say protracted war, it means that it takes hybrid and it takes kinetic and non-kinetic warfare together, okay? So each aspect is involved in this. We're only in one aspect, but there are many, okay, that need to be addressed. So we have military, you've got politics, okay? Social areas, you've got economics. What's happening on the economic front? Are the sanctions working? Are there enough sanctions? Are you targeting the right people? Are they going after the diamonds? Are they going, you know, the last 200 companies? What are the mechanisms that are necessary to monitor, okay, the actual, all of the material that's going towards Russia? These are the kind of things that we need to be asking and that the press should be asking. Yeah. That's the whole thing. We can yeah. take care of the informational in the sense that we can participate in that and make sure, right? through counter mess messaging and you no, know, through counter psychological me measures. Yes. That's the rest of it that. though, we need to press our leaders who have the levers of power, they have the tools of statecraft that they can, okay? There's, they should be doing their jobs yeah. in, in these areas that we cannot participate in directly. Well, Hi-Fi, you have something else you wanna bring up. It's not really a question, it's more of a statement. It's that, uh, you know, I look at geopolitics as kind of like the board game Go. Not chess, but Go. And it seems like there's a very simple move that democracies could make to end a lot of this ridiculousness and this chaos that's going on around the globe. And that simple move is 
arm Ukraine to the teeth and kick Vladimir Putin in his teeth. Where is the political will to do that? Because that's mm -hmm. what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Knock this crap off already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Actually, one thing I didn't talk about was uh, maybe I'll put some information together on what is happening in the occupied territories, because that I think is important for people to understand and why I say, thank God, Hi-Fi, you said that, because with Ukrainians under occupation, um, it breaks my heart, okay? I don't know how much they're suffering and what they're going through and what future generations, because this will affect future generations as well. So yeah, high five. That's basically it. They got to kick yeah. his ass and that's it. It's true. And and in order to kick his ass, we got to get rid of the fossil fuel fascists who actually prop him up. And, and the traitors in the United States, which yeah. are supporting him. Yes, 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 yes. Which are linked to the fossil fuel fascists as far as I'm concerned. But yes, 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 yes. Okay, unity and truth. Unity and truth. That's going to be our marching orders. And um, thank you as always for bringing us the information from Italy. Because I always feel like, you know, it's a microcosm of the bigger picture at play and it's always incredibly yeah, there's useful. so much going on there's so much going on austria i was with a, i was on the phone with a colleague for about an hour and he was giving me a de he was debriefing me on what was happening there it's all of the protests for peace all of that kind of stuff it's happening all over the universities by the way they're using the university campuses yeah. students groups. Yeah. i can i don't have it here you know oh, I clear do i you know, I, yeah, student groups, student unions, wherever. Sorry, I have, my, my desk is a complete mess. It doesn't look so bad. It doesn't look so bad. Oh, I can't find it right now. But anyway, the whole idea is that they're using student unions. They've penetrated them because now they have to yeah. spread their message once yeah. again and indoctrinate yeah. a new generation yeah. of people. Yeah. Right? That's the yes. that's the, the whole thing. I'm glad you that you brought that up because that's you know, and and it. we and we have to fight back, and that's the yeah. whole thing. We have to yeah. fight back, and uh, I think what you said was really important about psychological disarmament. We also have to practice our own psychological disarmament. We have to bring people back, and um, there are signs voting wise that people are uh, aware of what's happening and how much our democracy is at stake in America. But there's, you know, such a inequality when it comes to the money. There's the money is on the side of the fascists. And uh, and so, again, we're grateful for everybody who supports all of us as we do this work, because um, we're not going to stop. Yeah, no, definitely. And they may be stronger in terms of money, but our spirit, which is the most important thing, that's the thing that kept the Ukrainians going when they had Russians sitting there bombing the shit out of them. So we have to remember that that spirit comes from being free and that that could all disappear tomorrow if we're not careful.